Welcome to this first service, this early service, you early birds. Uh, glad that you're here this morning. We want to turn our attention to worship the Lord and uh, ask his blessing on our time together. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for the beauty of this day. We thank you for your steadfast love in our lives that uh, each day has new mercies. And that we pray that throughout this day, we would sense your mercy at work around us and your mercy at work uh, in our lives. We thank you for your people and that we're able to gather together with other believers today. We pray for those in our church family who are not able to be here. We pray you'll strengthen and encourage their hearts. And we pray you'll strengthen our hearts with grace in this hour. We love you and thank you for your faithful love to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is sure a weird time. It really is. And, you know, we're all so focused on the crazy news and the things going on around us that if we're not careful this year during Thanksgiving, it'll be really easy to focus on the challenges rather than the blessings. For the next three weeks, as a church family, we're going to sing about thankfulness and we're going to concentrate on all the things in the middle of a pandemic year that God has done for us and the ways that we are blessed. And so this morning, before we sing, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing, take just a second and I want you to think of one thing for which you are thankful today. I want you to hang on to that through the service, through the afternoon through the evening, and the night before you go to sleep, say, God, I am thankful for this. Stand with me as you sing, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing. Come Thou Found of Every Blessing To my heart to sing Thy praise Streams of mercy never cease all for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some men, Lord, yes, some men. Some by faith lead tons above. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and the Lord. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by. Safely to a private home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fall of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I am constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord. Like a feather, by my wandering heart to be. From to wander, Lord, I keep it. From to thee, the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. This next song we're going to sing is one we'll sing throughout the next three weeks. And you guys are all smiling at me. I don't know why. Because <laughs> I can't see, see the screens. I do realize I was not singing exactly the same thing you were. <laughs> we'll figure that out later. Uh, but for now, let's sing My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. And we will repeat this as kind of our theme song for the next three weeks to the Thanksgiving season. My
God's word, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 19 through 24. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. And may God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Great is our faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Let 
prayer for all of us. I invite you to take your Bible and turn to 1 Timothy, book of 1 Timothy chapter 3. As you're turning there, let me mention a, a few things. Don't forget the benefit for Ben Bryson, which is next, uh, well, this coming Saturday. Uh, we've announced that a few times in the past few weeks. It's from 11 to 3 at West Cheatham. Uh, also, I want to mention that be in prayer for Linda's family. Linda Hicks, her brother, passed away. The funeral's Today, so please keep their family in your prayers. And uh, there's an information sheet about Sunday school that's on, on the table. So I encourage you to pick up one of those. It lays out what we're going to be doing starting, Lord willing, on December 6th with Sunday school. And if you read through that and you have questions, um, you can ask any, any one of us. Particularly ask John and Terry and Donnie. Um, and they can give you some, some good answers about about Sunday school. But let's, uh, let's be praying to that end. And we're, we're looking forward to starting that back up. Uh, on December the 6th and last thing I wanted to say this morning as a church we weep with those who weep we rejoice with those who rejoice so we're, we're rejoicing we congratulate Bill Anderson on a recent uh, uh, position that he so we can clap for that congratulations Bill Bill First Timothy chapter 3 uh, I want to speak to you this morning I don't always tell you up front what I want to speak about but I'm going to tell you up front I want to tell you this morning I want to talk about why you need the church. 
why you need the church. I'm going to give you three reasons why you need the church. And I want to look at one verse in particular, 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll begin reading in verse 14, but verse 15 is our verse 15 is our text this morning. He says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. A pillar and the buttress of the truth. Now, not too long ago, I purchased something and the clerk, the person behind the counter said something like, do you want to purchase the, uh, the insurance or what, what's that called? I mean, what was it? the additional service plan? That's what it was, the service plan. And uh, as is typically the case, when they give me that option, I, I decline. Uh, I decline that option. I suspect you know what that's like. Uh, you, you've already spent probably all the money you had and some you didn't have. And they give you the opportunity to spend even more on something else. And so I, I politely decline. And uh, we face purchases like that all the time. I suppose the biggest kind of purchase that someone could make, I've never done this, but if you go out and buy a brand new car and you're actually ordering it from scratch, from the ground up, you've got the base package and then you can add all the bells and whistles. You can kind of customize it to fit uh, your dream. Uh, but we've all been down that road and we've all, we've all done that, where we have something that we're purchasing and we want, we want the item, but we're not sure we want the luxury item. We're not sure we want to, to add something on top of it. Well, I'm convinced that many people treat the church in the same way. What I mean by that is I think it's a fair analogy what I just said about how many people view the church because a lot of people learn how to treat the church as optional. In order to become a Christian, you obviously have to accept Jesus. People get that. But all this stuff about going to church and being involved in a church, being really connected to a local church, well, quite frankly, to a lot of people, that seems optional. That seems like uh, going with the service plan. So the answer to the question about Jesus for many people, not as many as we would like, but a lot of people will say yes to Jesus, but when it comes to church, the answer is, well, no, thank you. But the reality is the church isn't optional for us as Christians. It isn't presented. The church is not presented to us this way in the New Testament. In fact, the Bible teaches that a spiritually healthy Christian will be vitally connected to a local church. In order to be spiritually healthy, we must be vitally connected to a local church. And while there's a lot of benefits that come to us by being involved in a local church, we don't have time to go over all of those this morning. But what I want to spend our time on are three reasons that it's good for us to be involved in a church. Three reasons why you need the church. Now, I know as I'm looking out on a nine o'clock worship service, I'm speaking, so to speak, to the choir. I'm preaching to the choir because you're here. At some level, you agree with this idea that you need church. But let me also say that we all know that church is more than just attendance. Attendance is a big part of the church, gathering with other believers consistently to worship the Lord, to encourage each other. Gathering together is an important part, but we know that church is much more than that. It extends beyond one day a week. And even while you may already be on board with saying you need the church, I suspect you're going to encounter some people, maybe even this week, who are suspicious, who are skeptical that they really need the church. So I want to give you these reasons this morning, remind you of some reasons why you need the church and other people that you know need the church. These reasons are found in this one verse. They're implied in these descriptions that Paul gives about the church in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. So here's what we're going to talk about. You need the church, first of all, because it connects you to family. Secondly, you need the church because it reminds you of your identity. And thirdly, you need the church because it provides stability. So those are the three things we're going to talk about. They're all implied in these descriptions that Paul gives about the church in verse 15. Paul tells Timothy, if I delay, I want you to know how you ought to behave in the household of God. That's the first description, the household of God. You may have a version of the Bible that says the house of God. I want you to know how you should behave in the house of God. That's a literal translation, the house of God. 
And so when you think about this behavior in the house, we, especially in the South, we hear the house of God, we think about people referring to the sanctuary. I've heard that many times. For instance, someone might say, you shouldn't run in the house of God. You ever heard that before? You ever said it before? Or you shouldn't act like that in the house of God. And it's okay to, to, to say it in that way because people are trying to demonstrate a certain amount of respect for the building uh, that we set aside for worship. But we know from the rest of the New Testament that, that really the people, the church, is the house of God. It's, it's not a particular building or a structure. In fact, the, the Bible says that we, as the people of God, are the sanctuary, the dwelling place of God. And so here, when the ESV translates it household, that's exactly the idea. We are the household, the family of God. In fact, if you go back to the beginning of chapter 3, Paul is talking about the qualifications for pastors. And he, he lays out one of the qualifications is in order to be a pastor, he must manage his own household well. Not to perfection, by the way, but he must manage his own household well. Because if a man cannot manage his own household He's, he asks the question, how can he care for the church of God? Or in other words, if he can't manage his own family well, how can he care for God's family or God's household? And so here specifically, Paul is, is reminding us the church is the family of God. That when we become Christians, when we accept Jesus, do I need to do something? Is this Sir. microphone bothering you? What are you doing? John? It's Leah's fault. Well, I could, I could sing also. We could play a soundtrack in the back and I could just sing the sermon. Um, thank you for that. So when you accept Jesus, you also enter into a spiritual family. And when we throw around the words brother and sister, but it's actually theologically true. That when you accept Christ, we're in a family with Jesus as our Lord, as our elder brother, God as our father, and we have brothers and sisters. And what ought to mark our church and any other healthy church are the good marks of family, right? So think of some of the marks of a good biological family, for example. A good biological family has markers like people in the family are accepted. They know they actually belong. They may be rejected everywhere else, but when they get home to the family, they know they belong there. They're accepted. Things like responsibilities and privileges. Everybody in a biological family needs to have certain responsibilities, certain chores, things that they're responsible to do, meaningful work. And in a biological family, a healthy one at least, people know in the family they're cared for. That they care for one another. And those markers ought to be present in a spiritual family. Is there anyone here that doesn't need those things in their life, spiritually speaking, as a Christian? Now, I'm sure that many of you have good biological families, and that's wonderful. However, the Bible is very clear that every single one of us, regardless of how long we've been a Christian, regardless of our personality, some of us are more reserved and introverted, but regardless of our personality, we all need a spiritual family with these things present, where we're accepted, where we know we belong, where we have meaningful responsibilities and privileges, and where there's mutual care for one another. We need a group of people like that, where we are accepted, where we do belong, where we demonstrate our resp loving responsibility to each other, and we genuinely care for each other. Now, I've told you recently, and perhaps several times, during the pandemic over the last eight or 10 months, that this is an area where we've got a lot of work to do. One of the things that's happened over the last eight or 10 months is we've been separated so much is that I believe, it's my sense at least, that our connection to each other as a family has, has suffered some. I think that's true across the board when you look at churches and what we've had to do over the last eight or 10 months and all, this, all the stuff that's going on that we'd love to get past us, get, get behind us. We've got a lot of work to do when it comes to building family. Now, Sunday school is going to help with this because in, in those small groups, you're able to connect better with each other than you can in a large group like this. But Sunday school isn't going to solve it because, as I mentioned earlier, family is much more than one day per week. We're talking here about relationships. So you need the church. I need the church because 
It connects me to my spiritual family. Secondly, you need the church because it reminds you of your identity. You need the church because it reminds you of your identity. I'm getting that from the second phrase Paul uses to describe the church in verse 15. He says that this is the church of the living God. Talks about the church being the household, the family of God. But then he moves on to say the church is the church of the living God. But let's not gloss over that word church. The word church literally means those who have been called out. Now, don't think called out in the sense that you're called out, you're, you're made fun of, or you're called out because you're in trouble. But it literally means those who have been called out, the called out ones. The picture here is that God, is, his voice is calling out into the world. He's issuing an, an invitation. And those who, ex, who hear the voice of God calling, not in an audible voice, but in the scriptures that the spirit works in the world. They hear the, the truth of God's word. They hear the voice of God calling and they respond in faith. And they're called, therefore, out of the world and they're called unto the Lord. That's the picture. And we see this all throughout the Bible where people hear, so to speak, the voice of God. They hear God calling them out of to be different than the world and to live for him. We see examples of this all over the Bible. For instance, Abraham, when he was still named Abram in Genesis chapter 12, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. God always calls us out of something, but he calls us to something. Right? Calls out and to. And we read that in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said, go to this land I'm going to show you. And, in, and we read that Abraham or Abram went as the Lord told him. And by the way, he was 75 years old when that happened. It's never too late to make a spiritual decision to, to decide to follow the Lord. Or for instance, the, the entire nation of Israel that was called out of Egypt when God said through Moses to Pharaoh, you know the phrase, let my people go. They're my people, let them go so that they may serve me. And that's exactly what happened. God called them out of Egypt unto himself in his service. We think of Jesus calling the 12 disciples, these 12 ordinary men, the last people in the world that we would have selected, that the world would have selected, but nevertheless, Jesus calls them to forsake all and to follow him. And so the church here is pictured as those who are called out, those who've been called out of the world and unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're not called out of the world in the sense that we no longer engage the world around us. Being called out of the world does mean, though, that we're to be radically in the world but not of the world. That's tricky, isn't it? We're called to reach and to influence the world for Jesus. If we don't do that, then how are they going to come to know Christ? And so we're, we're called to reach the world, to influence the people we know that are unbelievers, to be radically in the world, immersed in it, but at the same time, not of the world because we are different. That's okay to be different. It's okay. In fact, the church should be markedly different than the world. We should have a different way of viewing the world. We should have a different value system, a different way of ethics, because we're marching to the beat of a different drum, right? We're marching according to the scriptures. And so we're called out of the world, but we're to reach the world for Christ, to be in the world, but not of it. And so this can be tricky. But that's what our calling is. This is our identity, right? To reach and influence the world, but to resist the temptation to become like the unbelieving world around us. But this is our identity, the church of the living God. The church, those who are called out to hear the voice of the living God, and we obey. We, we listen to him. I know we normally reserve this song for Easter, but there's a song in our hymnal that says, I serve a risen Savior. Who's in the world today? I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. 
You haven't bought into the lie that God is dead, have you? No. We are the church of the living God. That's our identity. It's okay for us to be different. This is who we are. We are the church, those that have been called out graciously by God to live for him. And so week after week, month after month, year after year, the church is reminding, we're reminding each other, this is our identity. This is who we are, the church. Finally, you need the church because it provides stability. The church connects us to our spiritual family. It reminds us of our identity. We're the church of the living God. We belong to him. And finally, it provides us stability. That's the last phrase in verse 15 where Paul says, the church is a pillar and buttress of the truth. Pillar and foundation or the support of the truth. What people ought to find in the church is the truth. Seems like in the culture today, it's pretty hard to find the truth, isn't it? But for the church, the, the truth should be the, the thing that, that people always find when they gather with the church. The truth, mind you, that's spoken in love. It should always be spoken in love. But when we cease to speak the truth as a church, we are, in fact, no longer loving. No, Paul says the church's responsibility is to support the truth, to hold firmly to the truth and then to hold it forth to the world. We hold tightly to the truth, to sound doctrine, and we also hold it forth to the world. That's our role as a church. You remember Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And we know as Christians that the Bible, God's word is truth. This is what the Holy Spirit takes as he does his work in the world, the truth of the Bible, and he sets people free. If they'll listen. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. So God is deeply concerned. God is the God of truth and he wants his church to be a church that's all about truth. God's word is the rock solid support of our lives. And the church here is described as the pillar, the foundation of the truth. You see, you need, I need a group of people, the church that will tell me the truth. I don't need people to spin the story for me. I don't need people to look at my life and spin things around like I want to hear them. I need a group of people that will tell me the truth. Don't you? I need people, a group of people, the church that will remind me of the truth, that will rebuke me with the truth when it's necessary. I need a group of people that will encourage me with the truth. Why? Because Monday through Saturday, I hear all kinds of stuff that's not the truth. And I know you do as well. So when we come together as believers, this ought to be the place or more appropriately, when we gather together with other believers, we ought to be the people that are constantly rehearsing the truth to each other. It's OK for us to talk about politics and this and that and the other. But the church, the people of God ought to be people of truth, people of truth. And I need the church because it provides me stability, doesn't it? You. I'm not asking for an amen about the sermon, but I'm, I'm saying that when we come together every week, I'm, I'm reminded it gives me stability in a very unstable world. So the church has these benefits for, for every person, including you. Now, I want to be clear as I kind of bring this to a close. This is a short sermon. You can't amen that. There, there is no one church or one denomination that has a corner on, on the market of truth. We're talking about the church and how you need the church. We need to take a big step back, though, and understand the Bible is a big book, and there's a difference of interpretation on a number of passages. The difference of interpretation by brothers and sisters in Christ is the reason denominations exist. I have good friends who see things differently in the Bible than I do. and We couldn't go start a church together. We agree on some very common core issues in the Bible, like everybody's created in the image of God, and yet we're also sinners. 
we agree that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died on the cross for our sins and rose again from, from the dead and that repentance and faith in Him is necessary for salvation. We agree on some core issues, but sometimes, my good friends, we, we disagree on other things in the Bible, like, like baptism, like the ordinances or whatever. That's why denominations exist. We, we interpret some things differently. But all that to say is that Bethel Church isn't the only church that's doing the Lord's work. Wherever churches are being faithful to the teaching of Scripture and seeking to honor Christ and make disciples in those places and among those people, God is doing some good things. As I mentioned recently, we are not in competition with other churches. But I do want to hasten to say I am thankful that our church is part of the church. This is not the church, but we are part of the church. We're part of this big picture that God is doing, painting in the world. We have nothing to be ashamed of as free will Baptists. More pointedly, we have a great church family right here in front of us. And as long as we are faithful to the Lord, seeking to make disciples, we have much to offer to the world around us. We have much to offer to our community. The church is where people can find real spiritual family. The church is the place they can be connected to their real, true identity. And the church is the place they can find stability. Listen, you most definitely, absolutely need Jesus. That's what Christianity is all about. If you're here this morning and you hear me talk about how much you need the church, please don't hear me saying you don't need Jesus. That's what Christianity is all about. It's about turning, placing your faith, all of your confidence and trust in Jesus Christ who loved you so much that he died on the cross and rose again from the dead. And God invites you to have a relationship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we all desperately, absolutely need Jesus. But in order to follow him, you and I also need the church. I wonder if you believe that. You desperately need Jesus. But in order to follow him, you and I also desperately need the church. And here's how I want to close. The church also needs you. The church needs you. Just this year, I wouldn't dare to name people, but just this year, we've lost, we've lost a lot of folks. Going on to meet, to be with the Lord. We can't replace them. I'm not suggesting that at all. But we do need you to step up. You need the church, but the church also needs you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this church family. And we, I give you praise this morning that um, this is a, a good group of people. As I say to people often when they ask about our church, it's, it's made up of so many good people. Thank you for those that you've called to be here among us. And we pray that our numbers would grow, not for the sake of numbers, but for the sake of your kingdom. We pray that you'll help us in these days to reach out more with the gospel. We pray that your spirit would build in our community a greater sense of family. We pray that you'll help us to care for one another. We pray that you'll build back our Sunday school in a very strong way in the coming weeks. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to remember our identity in these days, that we would not be ashamed of the gospel, and that we would truly be your church in these dark days. And Father, we also pray that you'll, that you'll be the stability of our times, that we would remind each other of your truth, that we'll be people of truth. And we thank you for your presence here among us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. John? Could you run that, please? If our children's church age kids could come join me. Thank you all so much for your patience with uh, our lyrics and uh, with audio visual things. I tried to throw Leah under the bus on that deal, but that was my fault, too. So thank you for your presence. Hey guys, come right over here so everybody can see us. I am so glad y'all are here today. It's a good looking group. Everybody good? I'm glad to hear it. All right, this is what I thought we might do today. We've been talking about Thanksgiving a little bit. You know, today we've been singing about it because it's coming. 
Next week, right? What you guys like to eat? What's somebody's favorite Thanksgiving something? Turkey? I like turkey too. It's pretty good. Uh, uh, I like cranberry sauce. Y'all like that cranberry sauce? Red? <laughs> no? Come on, guys. It's delicious. When you dump it out and it's still got the can on it. Oh, I can. Anyway, let's focus, okay, everybody? I want us to go one at a time. Don't get nervous, because you can do this. One at a time. I want us to say something we're thankful for. Okay? I love getting to hear from you guys. So be thinking, what am I thankful for? Are you getting it in your head right now? What am I so thankful for? You know what I'm thankful for? I had stinking COVID a while back. A couple of months ago, I'm okay now. I put my mask on to make you feel more comfortable. But I'm doing good now. And whenever I had that, I lost my taste. And I thought, well, I'll still eat. And it'll be delicious, I'm sure. Or I'll just eat because I like to practice eating. But whenever you eat stuff and you can't taste it, it just tastes like mud, kind of. I mean, it don't have a taste. It just feels like mud. And it was gross. But God gave us 10,000 taste buds to taste tons of different flavors. And he did that because he loves us and wanted us to enjoy stuff. Like, get this taste in your mouth. Bologna. <laughs> cheesecake. Bologna cheesecake would be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> bologna and cheesecake? No? Okay. All right. Everybody got in your mind something you're thankful for? You got something? All right, here we go. Wait till you get the microphone because we don't want to miss it. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Thankful for Thanksgiving. It's a big circle. That's wonderful. I'm thankful for Thanksgiving myself. How about you? Turkey. Look at that. Man <laughs> likes turkey right there. Must have a good turkey over there in his house. How about you? Family. Well, I love your family too. That works out perfect. My family. Look at there. You put the pressure on her because you were going to get a prize <laughs> when you got home. And she had to go there too. How about you? Everything. That's a big old bunch of stuff. If you had to narrow it down just a little bit more than that, can you think of something? I mean, I'll take everything, but I bet you got something real specific. Church. Church. That's beautiful. I'm going to say that you're thankful for me because I'm here at the church. Okay? Can I make that jump? How about you? <laughs> Everything. You guys are just so thankful like people. Looks like you got some a pretty good sister and brother there to hang on to. That's not too shabby. How about you? My family. You know what? I love your family too. And I'm thankful for them too. That works out perfect. On the count of three, I want everybody out there to say something you're thankful for. You ready? Got it in your mind? Here it comes. One, two, three. My family. <laughs> I heard like half the people said Mr. John. Did you hear that? Don't you give me those eyebrows right there. They said it. All right. You guys did so well. I think that when we're done here, we're going to go right back over there behind that thing where Mr. Donnie is, and I am going to give you guys a prize. Is that okay? You thankful for prizes? <laughs> yes. Good. Does anybody want to pray for us before we go? Anybody? You want to? And will pray for us. All right, here we go. Let's pray. Jesus. Thank you for today. Thank you for today. Amen. 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 You're dismissed. Thank you. <laughs>